Yeah. Um, and you're yeah, I saw the documentary, and people don't believe this, but first and foremost, I was in my own little world. Before, a lot of black sheep in my family. My uncle was one of those black sheep. I'm another one. So I was in my world. I'm a motivational speaker by trade. I was going, for over 10 years, going to high school, middle schools, and elementary schools, talking to kids about bullying and staying away from drugs. There's nothing sadder than having a nine-year-old or 12-year-old commit suicide. So bullying is real. And it, one good thing about bullying, they don't care if you're black, white, green, yellow, or purple. It's, it, it's a non-discriminative, rich or poor. It's an equal opportunity offender. So I was doing that. And that, that career took me all the way to South Korea. I spoke at Camp Humphreys military base, 6,000 kids there. So I was doing my thing. And I was back home and just happened to be on Netflix. And then I see my uncle's face. <laughs> So I started watching this documentary and I had no clue, no clue that my uncle was such a big deal. Even when my uncle used to live, and this is another part of the I tie in, my uncle used to live with me, my mother, and my father down in Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida, where, we, where I was born and raised, for about a year or so in between spots. He'd stay one spot, then he'd hop to another musician thing. But he used to say, Rod, I used to play with Al Bro, I used to play with Sure, sure you played with so and so and so and so. Had no clue. And we used to have house parties and my uncle would pack them in there and playing the guitar, drinking his liquor, and everybody having a good time. And I had no clue. I thought everybody uncle did that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have no reference. It's just something we did. And fast forward years later, I come to find out that he was this blues legend. And my mouth was like And if you watch the back the documentary at some point it seemed like the music ended or it would end. And I thought it was such a shame that the music could end. And uh, I found out, you know, I used to rehearse and one of his songs came on, uh, I have it on my iPod, and I just started singing over it and I was amazed how our voices kind of blended. I have a roughness and he, he was a little octave lower than me, but we were in the same range, in the ballpark. And I said, wow, I sound like my uncle. And that a light bulb came on, you know what? I shot Adam an email. You know, it's a shame that the music should end. I would love to do some kind of tribute. Wasn't even trying to do all this. I just wanted to honor his spirit. And, and we got in the studio and magic happened. Because they didn't believe I could sing. Because Adam would tell you it's a hard thing to do. It just I mean, we're not even a blues band, right? I mean, I mean, I, the harmonica player is playing foot drums. We're a guitar player, no bass, no real drummer. And I'm thinking, how, how much experience do you have like, with live blues bands? Well, you have a lot of experience, but Zero. dance contests. Yeah, I, I was doing a whole other world. Zero? Are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. What a, Zero. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, then that's all the more amazing. All the more amazing. Now, I did. Now, it did work out because about four years before the documentary, I had, in between, I had a lot of downtown when I wasn't speaking in schools. And so I started going into senior citizen uh, assistant livings nursing homes and I was doing a Motown review. And I was doing that for the seniors and memory care and all that. And that took, because a lot of seniors have the same spirit as kids, especially in the nursing homes. And so I was doing that about five, six times a week, <laughs> people calling. And so that got my vocals where it needed to be. And through the years I was in a acapella group. So it kind of helped me because I don't have any background singers or nothing, it's just me and trying to keep up with what these geniuses, they, they're beasts on their instruments. But I got one freedom that most blues bands don't have. I can engage the audience. And so I can have fun with you. They're working, but I'm having, I'm having fun. You want, you, one more thing, you know, I don't know if it'll happen today, but maybe, but I mean the dance element with, you know, there's not a lot of guys or gals out on the blues circuit that had the dance background that you did. You were like doing Michael Jackson Oh, things yeah. when you were a teenager, right? Yo, I, like, I was a Michael Jackson impersonator back in the early 80s. I, I mean, I was in school, I was making like $5,000 going to different skate rings, and one edge I had over all the other impersonators, because they looked like Michael, and they could dance, and I could do that too, but I could do one thing that they couldn't do. I could talk Michael. If you close your eyes, you'll hear me say, uh, the next song I would like to do for you is one of my favorites, and then, uh, Tito, 
Tito, Jermaine, and the rest of the gang. <laughs> and then the waiting for us, we'll come back. That's the first. Thank you, Vince. We need to take you out. So the girls will go crazy, and I make a lot of money. So that <laughs>